Robert Lewis and Lewis search for a Lewis Russell composition as young Catherine looks on. Jack Bradley photo. <laughs> Lewis and his wife, Lucille Armstrong, were gracious hosts, welcoming his pianist and swing era orchestra leader, Lewis Russell, plus members of Lewis's current band, the All-Stars, Peanuts Huckle, Tommy Young, Danny Barcelona, etc. You can't blame me for wanting to dance. Lyric from Swing That Music, recorded by Lewis Armstrong and Lewis Russell in 1936. Chops, chops, chops. I just want to mention, you know, you, you folks are seeing incredibly rare archival film that really no one else has seen yet. Right. Uh, this is uh, incredible. Absolutely incredible. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. So Carlene, in addition to starring in this little movie, was doing a lot of the filming. She was behind the camera. So uh, Lewis Russell was a, a home movie buff. And together they would take the camera around and there, there are like 20 reels of film that are just incredible. So Catherine, talk about this photo and how, how does this relate to your mom and, and your dad? Well, uh, how it relates to my dad, I'm not sure, but uh, this was before, oh, so this is the year actually that my mother and my father met. And this was the trio that my father hired um, at a club called Town Hill in Brooklyn that he managed and, and booked. And so um, what happened was that, you know, and he had different, they had different rooms, so there were different groups in each room. And um, so my father, you know, they started to, I guess, take a liking to each other, you know, as soon as uh, he hired her. They just kind of charmed each other. You know, they were both very charming individuals and uh, known for that. And so uh, Lewis Russell, you know, kept inviting my mother over. You know, oh, you can come stay with me. You can come, you can, just come stay with me. You know, you can come stay with me. So she kind of resisted for a while. And then 
uh, as she told the story one night, she showed up at the club with a little suitcase, with an overnight bag, and didn't say anything, and she just put it down, and a big smile came over his face. And that was probably somewhere around the end of 1955, uh, going into the beginning of 1956, and I was born in September of 1956. So that, that was one of the rhythm sections of the Sweethearts, uh, as you can see from the caption. So Carleen, as Catherine mentioned, was born in 1925 in Harlem. Her father, Elisha Manasseh Ray, is pictured here, as well as young Carleen with her f father's tuba at age four, and, and hat, and a very rare photo of her mother, Mary Catherine Ray. And she loved that bear in this photo. She used to talk about that bear all the time. That was her favorite, her favorite toy. Carlene went to uh, public schools in New York City. This is her junior high school graduation diploma, January of 1939. And as teenagers would often do, uh, Carleen went to the New York World's Fair in 1940 and took a little souvenir tchotchke photo that was in metal. And she went on to graduate from high school in 1941, June of 41. And I should mention, you know, Wadley High School uh, is still down, you know, uh, I, th I think it's at 114th Street uh, off of Lenox, uh, you know, a very historic uh, school with all kinds of distinguished uh, musicians here coming out of there. Graduates and folks yeah. coming out of it. And so one of the things that we love here at the museum about this kind of presentation is that uh, it's not just a one-off and it intersects with so much of the other uh, historical programming that we have and just be and because the family's involved here and they're sharing this incredible archive, we're able to fill in parts of, you can think of a crossword puzzle or a jigsaw puzzle. All kinds of pieces are starting to come together uh, only because a family is willing to share its archive. And I guess the fact that your mother was such a dedicated keeper of her story. Yes. Uh, this is just, I just want to underline how, how unusual and how special this is that, that you've organized it in such a fashion. Thank you, Lauren. You were well. That's why we're here. Yeah, that's why we're here. Let's go. Oh. One thing you'll notice about Carlene is that she was quite an attractive woman. In fact, she had suitors from a very uh, young. young young age. We we found this in the archive, which was. Uh, a sketch of her, this was during World War II, mailed to her by Private James H. Harris from his base in Salina, Kansas. So Carleen entered Juilliard in 1941 and was giving recitals. Um, here's a program from one she gave in 1943. And um, below the program on the right is a history of Carleen Ray. So I'll just read uh, some of this. Carleen Ray, age 18, started her musical career at age four, coached by her father, who was a graduate of the Juilliard School of Music. She made her first public appearance at the age of 11, and while a student at Wadley High School, was the accompanist of the Junior Glee Club of the school. In 1941, she entered the Juilliard School of Music, where she is now working for her degree of Bachelor of Science majoring in piano. I just want to add here that, you know, that there's a whole history, um, an African-American history at the Juilliard School that most people don't know about because usually it's usually talked about in the context of when jazz came into the school. Uh, I was part of the first faculty that came into jazz and uh, into Juilliard in 2001, and I remember what we said was that jazz brought Juilliard kicking and screaming into the 20th century. <laughs> but anyway. 
the point is, is that Duke Ellington himself started a scholarship at Juilliard in 1945 and 1946, but because there was no jazz instruction, uh, people like Elaine Jones, who was a percussionist, and others benefited from this. But what's so fascinating about this and, and these documents, this is before that. And, uh, and someone who has such a direct link to, to all the legacies of jazz. This is, I'm, I'm going to stop coming back every five minutes and just saying, <laughs> isn't this wonderful? <laughs> but I just want to underline some of the threads here. Thank you. And Carlene was proficient, as, both, as Catherine mentioned, as both, both a classical vocalist and a popular musical vocalist and a blues vocalist and a jazz vocalist. But in, in the era that she came up, it was very common, like in, in vaudeville shows, in black vaudeville, to go from like a comedian to a tap dancer to a classical vocalist. Yes. And also, if you look at these pieces that she's playing, this is nothing to sneeze at. No, I'm serious. I mean, this is very technically challenging, real classical piano. And it's just something that I wonder how many people who met her as a bassist, who met her playing the various instruments, singing, also knew that she had this capability of, I mean, of really playing classical piano. She, she, she switched to composition at, at, uh, in her last year at Juilliard and never really, you know, kind of like Nina Simone, you know, in those days, what were they going to do with it? Sure. So she pretty much went on to, to jazz, you know, instrumentally after that. So a very interesting discovery in going through Carlene's scrapbooks and things that she saved Remember the earlier photo of the Edna Smith trio from 1955? I talked to Carlene about that, and I said, that was sort of sweetheart alums, right? And she kind of paused and said, well, yes, but. And the dot, 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 the but, was that while Carlene was be way before Sweethearts, when she was a student at Juilliard, she was gigging around New York City, Newark, with a drumless trio guitar, piano, and bass. We found this photo of her performing in Newark in 1943 or 44. I also want to mention that, you know, this is in the ages, of, in, in the days of segregation. The Robert Treat Hotel, which is right next to where WBGO is in Newark, uh, was famous that the president stayed there. And when oh. you go there on the outside, you'll see President, you know, Roosevelt and President, all these people stayed there. So again, just to put this in the context of an African-American trio, having a gig in that place at that time, uh, it's, it's especially uh, important. And Lord knows what the, if President Roosevelt wheeled through the room, you know? <laughs> and this, this is during World War II, as you can see from um, over Carlene's shoulder, a serviceman in, un in uniform. And so again, uh, Carlene is getting out there and gigging this format of the drumless trio, piano, bass, and guitar was very commercially successful. You had Nat Cole Trio, you had Johnny Moore's Three Blazers, and so Carlene was developing this as a vehicle to work and to, to work as a vocalist. And so amazingly, in February of 46, she played a, a gig um, at a club in the village, which was reviewed in Billboard. The, the group was called Melody Maids, and she was on a bill with um, Charles Linton, former Chick Webb singer, Lolita, Burke Twins, and the Earl Bostic Orchestra. And you can see they said, Melody Maids relieved during intermission. Piano, bass, and guitar combo is effective, but conversation stops dead when Carlene Ray, guitar player, opens up with that deep, bottomless, beautiful voice. Girls should avoid over-dramatizing. She has enough in those tonsils to put her across. <laughs> Love that old showbiz lingo. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> it's a wonder she hasn't been snapped up for a bigger club. I have a question. Are these segregated rooms that they're playing, or are they integrated? Do you know? Not in the village. The village was pretty, was pretty wide open in those days. The hotel rooms weren't. But she played in that hotel. And Charles Linton, if you all used to go see Doc Cheatham, yeah, Charles Linton was still singing into his 90s. With his turban. And guesting with his turban. Sharp, sharp dressed man in his turban. <laughs> Another graphic from the archive. Club Zanzibar, I believe, was in Harlem. 
April of 46, Carlene and Edna Smith, again, they're classmates at Juilliard at this point. Edna Smith was my eighth grade teacher, Kathy. Really? Yes. I'm going to repeat that. That, that was Paula was more the daughter of Maxine Sullivan, and she was just saying that the bass player, Edna Smith, was what? Her, your eighth grade teacher. Okay. She had the orchestra in school, and all, only reason and I'm the jazz band. Only reason I'm repeating it on the mic is yeah, for yeah, folks who can't hear it out in, out in TV land. Amazing. Okay. Amazing. <laughs> so in May of 1946, Carlene graduates from Juilliard, and immediately uh, after the graduation ceremony, joins the International Sweet Arts of Rhythm as guitarist and vocalist. And this photo, which is actually from Leonard Feather's archive, shows the band in rehearsal in a. a Anna Mae Winborn, who fronted the orchestra, is uh, directing there. And, and right over her shoulder, you can see Carlene. And of course, this, this intersects with the museum's history and programming, because Eddie Durham had been the musical director of this band. And we right. were just part of a wonderful Many arrangements. Right. And uh, a documentary about him and this band. So it all, it all intersects. It's funny, though. And Carlene, I'd like to ask you about this. You know, so here's a picture from. Oh, let's see how good my math is. Uh, almost 80 years ago. Chucks. Mm -hmm. Jesus. Okay. 78 years ago. And it's an all-girl band, or what yep. they used to call an all-girl band. Jazz really still has a long way to go in terms of gender stuff, doesn't it? In terms of the, the, the instrumentalists. And here we are 80 years later, and it's still a mountain that still kind of needs to be climbed. There are many reasons for that. So that's a whole other... We can spend another two hours on that. Let's get back to Carlene Ray. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. This is a classic photo, and you can see Carlene with her pompadour hairdo and guitar. And this is the guitar. Ooh. Yeah. This very guitar. So let's let's uh, take a, a look at a soundy. Um, which features Vi Burnside on saxophone. Great to see Carlene on the guitar right in front of us there. So we just excerpted that in, in the interest of getting through some more material. This is a, an incredible piece that we found, typewritten on a crumbled piece of paper, rules and fines governing discipline of sweethearts of rhythm. So I'll just read some of these. Uh, no member shall be late on bandstand, if so, fine, a dollar per minute. No smoking on bandstand, if so, fine, one dollar. No drinking on bandstand, at any time, fine, five dollars. Anyone drunk on bandstand, twenty-five dollar fine, and subject to dismissal. Profane language on bandstand, two dollars. If at any time anyone is caught with reefers in the bus or in the organization, instant dismissal, and so forth. Uh, 
when playing one-nighters in theaters and clubs, all musical programs are under supervision by Maurice King, who is a director, and directress subject to approval of Mrs. Jones, Grace Allen Jones, who was uh, the director with her husband of the uh, Pineywood School. Um, and then, uh, let's see, beds must be made up and kept clean at each day. Be extremely careful as to smoking in the bus. Dangerous in case of fire, absolutely no smoking in beds. Uh, you know, they had to look neat uh, at all times. Rehearsals eight hours per week to be called by Mr. King and failing to make rehearsals on time unless ill and special permission will be fined one dollar per hour. So, many, many rules. Can I have a copy? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> Maybe after this we'll go to the, uh, to the interview with Carlene that you have. Yeah. But why don't we conclude with yes. this photo? So, um, Carlene coming out of the backstage door at the Royal Theater um, with, with the Sweethearts, and Carlene describes how there was a circuit that where, where the, they, they did a lot of one-nighters, but there, were, there was a circuit of theaters that would book groups for a week or two weeks at a time. The Royal in Baltimore, the Apollo in New York, the Howard in Washington, D.C., the Paradise in Detroit, and the Million Dollar in Los Angeles. And I'm taking that information from a letter that she wrote to Mark Cantor, who was doing research on, this, on the Soundies. So she, she was providing historic, researchers would knock on her apartment door and say, what do you got? You know? Well, that's why we had her here 20 years ago <laughs> to document it. Now we're going to go to something here. Uh, Catherine, can you just, just tell us what this uh, excerpt, this film by, I assume, a relative Someone named Ray, right? Uh, no, no, the sure. interview excerpt that you uh, have of your mom? No? I'm not sure what we're, what we're going to see. Not, not, not that this. one. The, the, the one that, that you folks have. The, uh, there we go. Oh, K.D. Ray is a uh, documentarian out of uh, Seattle. And so she interviewed... Um, these are, it, it's the series is Lady Be Good... And she also interviewed Bertha Hope oh, I see. and other uh, jazz women. And so um, we have but, this uh, footage. I've never had any Only reason that I thought it was a relative was just was the name Ray. So I said, oh. And mean. her name is K.D. Ray, which is, <laughs> you know, amazing. So I, I just want to just interject just real here. Last week we talked about a mood. And we talked about uh, with Maxine Sullivan. And you're going to find it, of course, true also here with Carlene Ray and also with Lil Armstrong is that if you were around these people, um, I don't know how to describe it, who they were, the way they talked, the way they sang, they had a very unique viewpoint and like a mood that they established. And when I think of your mom, um, first thing that comes to mind is just that, 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 that voice. It's just the voice comes to mind. And then, of course, all the other attributes, incredible, everything that she accomplished. And, and this is really important now because now we're going to actually see and hear Carlene, when was this done? How old would she be this here? This was in roughly? the 90s, so uh, I think she was in her early 70s at that point. Okay, all right. Looking amazing. <laughs> I was playing electric bass. I, I, I did it because I enjoyed doing it. Uh, and, and usually in, in the, uh, in the uh, freelance field, you get uh, known by word of mouth. You know, people saying, well... I saw this uh, person playing someplace and blah, blah, blah. I think I'd like to use her on a gig and see what happens, you know. So if they like what you're doing, they're going to hire you. And the thing is, is that uh, I always got hired because people liked the way I played. And it's just that simple. I never had a problem with anybody on this uh, subject. And I can say that unequivocally again. And I don't know, and, and I, I've never had, felt self-conscious about it. Although I must say that I like to be challenged. And so because of the fact that uh, the bass, fiddle, uh, electric, and acoustic challenges me. I like that because uh, uh, I have to be challenged in order to grow. And I tell my students that all the time. And I'm not even talking about bass students because I don't have any bass students. And the only one I do have is, uh, at, right now, is my daughter. I help her, uh, but she plays other instruments too. But the thing is, is that 
when you're doing something that you enjoy doing and it, 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 it motivates you to get up in the morning, so to speak, to have something to do that day and so forth, uh, that's enough, for me in any case, that's enough motivation for me to keep going because I'm always, there's something new I learn every day. I meet somebody, I meet another bass player I didn't know before. And uh, it's, it's one of those kinds of things. There's always something that I'm learning. You know, I, I'm constantly learning. And I'll th I don't think I'll ever be the bass player that I want to be but uh, uh, it's so much fun trying to get there. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about some of the groups that you played with along the way. Um, She's saying, tell us about some of the groups that you played well, with. Well, the very first big band I ever played with uh, was the Sweethearts of Rhythm. And I wasn't playing bass then. In fact, the uh, young lady that I've continually referred to, Edna Smith, uh, was the bass player with the band. In fact, the way we got with that band was a very interesting story. Uh, I was playing guitar with this with the trio, which uh, came out of the Sweethearts of Rhythm. Uh, Pauline Braddy was playing drums. Uh, uh, I was on guitar, and uh, what was her name? Jackie King was playing piano. We had a trio at that time, and. Uh, at the time, this was a time when our particular uh, agent was Nat Nazaro, who was well known in the field at that time, back in the early, late 30s, early 40s, and so forth, because he handled several well known black groups. Uh, some instrumental and some dance, some comedians and so forth. A couple of the groups, let me see, were Coke and Pope, Stump and Stumpy, uh, Steve Gibson and the Red Caps. Uh, let me see who else. Uh, one other I can remember. Anyway, he had a lot of those kinds of groups that were in in vaudeville and. Uh, a lot of the black entertainment around the country because back in those days there still was not a mixture of entertainment between the races that much. And so uh, this particular day Edna had her uh, acoustic bass with her and I had, I, I was like, I don't remember now, no I wasn't carrying an instrument, but anyway, we were on our way from Nat Nazaro's office which was in the Brill Building, 1619 Broadway, that was a well-known and still is a well-known building where a lot of songwriters used to uh, have offices and they used to play their music for uh, different publishing companies and one thing and another. And Matt Nazaro's office was in this particular building and we were on our way home, at, in fact, from his office. And we were walking down Broadway to the subway. And this nice-looking corpulent gentleman came up to Edna and said, excuse me, mister, don't I know you? So she says, I'm sorry, sir. If you're not a musician, forget it, because I'm, I'm, we're on our way home now. I'm, we're very hungry. We're on our way home to get something to eat. He said, no, wait, would you please wait a minute? Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Maurice King, and I'm the musical director for the Sweethearts of Rhythm. And we're looking for some ladies to replace some ladies who are leaving. So uh, he then told us what the situation was, and. Uh, so when he saw Edna was her bass, I guess he probably figured well, he'd, he would ask us because uh, he was recruiting at the time. So we went back upstairs to Nat Nazaro's office and gave him all the pertinent information that he needed. And he told us that, and then actually the, the, the configuration of our group was exactly what he needed for replacement at, in the Sweethearts of Rhythm. So as time passed, and that was the uh, year that I was graduating from the Juilliard School, 1946. So uh, I told him that, well, I would be very happy to, to go and join the Sweethearts, but I wasn't going to leave my graduation exercises for, to do that. I said, if you could wait a couple of weeks till after graduation, I'd be very happy to join the, the band. So Edna went on, the bass player, she went on, and Jackie King went on ahead of me, and they joined the band in St. Louis, which is uh, where I had to go afterwards, after graduation. So that was the first big band that we belonged to. 
that I belong to and we belong to as a part of the Sweethearts of Rhythm. I'll just mention, you know, at that time, Juilliard was where Manhattan School of Music is now. It was up at 122nd Broadway. Oh. It's long before it moved down to, uh, down to Lincoln Center. Yeah. At that point. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, folks, I think it's time for some live music. <laughs> and we are so thrilled. I mean, when, when, when I asked Catherine Russell to come and just be on the panel to talk, I didn't even imagine you know, that you would consider performing for us because you've got some very big gigs <laughs> coming up, to be honest with you, at this time, just about to go into Lincoln Center and Dizzy's Club and stuff. Would you join me in welcoming once again now as, a, as our great vocalist, Catherine Russell. <laughs> Thank you so much, and thank you, Lauren, and thank you, Paul. May I introduce Yuka Aikawa on piano. And Yuka um, has done a lot of gigs with Carlene over many years. Uh, Carlene was a member of the Lance Hayward Singers, and uh, Yuka was an accompanist for that choir for many, many years. And also, um, Yuka was the pianist on the album of called Vocal Sides of Carlene that I produced in 2013. So, Yuka and her husband Atsundo Aikawa on bass, and we had Mark McLean on the drums. So now, this is this first one um, Carlene recorded, and um, she uh, told me that she wrote the second chorus of this uh, of this tune. So when I grow too old to dream. When I grow too old to dream I'll have you to remember And when I grow too old to dream, your love will live in my heart. So kiss me, my sweet, and say we will part. For when I grow too old to dream, your love will live in my heart. When I grow too old, much too old to dream, I'll have you, just you, no one but you to remember from January to December when old rocking chair gets me no way hey, hey, for me to stray. I won't forget you cause your love will live in my heart. So kiss, 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 kiss me goodnight. And so it's time to go, let us part, sweetheart. And when I grow too old, much too old to dream, your love, your love will live in my heart. So it's time to go, 
let us part, sweetheart. And when I grow too old, much too old to dream, your love, your love will live in my heart. Mm -hmm. Your love, your love will live in my heart. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is uh, trying to do tunes that all pertain to Carlene in some form. So uh, this was one that um, when she was in the group Jazzberry Jam uh, that was sung by uh, the vocalist at that time Gwen Cleveland. So this was the first time I had heard that tune, and then later I heard Dinah Washington's version and Nancy Wilson's version and all the other versions. But um, I fell in love with it from hearing Gwen sing this. In the dark It's just you and I not a sound, not one sigh, just the beat of my poor heart in the dark. In the dark, I get such a thrill. When he presses fingertips upon my lips and he begs me, please be still in the dark. Well, soon this dance will be ending.
rest what the rest what the rest have left behind so just let them dance while we find romance pretty baby in the dark thank you so much So uh, this next one, of course, we're all familiar with. And uh, Jazzberry Jam also recorded this one. And I think um, Ulysses Slaughter was the, yeah, was the vocalist at that time with Jazzberry Jam. <laughs> Feeling fancy free And I'm not alone I've got company Everything's okay The live long day With this mellow song I can't go wrong In a mellow tone that's the way to live If you mope and groan Something's got to give So go your way And laugh and play There's joy unknown so much and I have to mention that every uh, summer in Bryant Park for the piano series Yuka is playing so please look out for her it's a, it's a very relaxing and mellow experience Yuka Aikawa we're gonna take a five-minute break folks 
uh, but a real five minutes. <laughs> so uh, stay put or walk around, whatever, and we'll, we'll, we'll be back in five. Thank you. Short break. to do a quick gloss on all the different things that you've done, but just to, we're, we're going to keep focusing on, you know, on, on the various...
Hello, folks. We're back for our second half of this presentation. Uh, just one quick thing, uh, which I want to let you all know, which is I'd like to uh, just let you know for about 60 seconds about the history of the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Uh, how many are here for the first time? That's not bad. That's not bad. That's a nice mix. OK, well, welcome. Uh, the National Jazz Museum started, oh, just around the year 2001. And we used to be located, and in fact, this video you're about to see was shot over in our original home, which was over on East 126 between Park and Lexington. In fact, if you, if you take the Metro North train, you can still see there's kind of like a faded advertisement on the side of the building there. And our first um, major public program, we had two. One were performances at the Rubin Museum of Art, a series called Harlem in the Himalayas. And then the other thing was Harlem Speaks. And the idea with Harlem Speaks was that we started an oral history uh, series that still goes on to this day. And now there are hundreds, hundreds of archival interviews. And one of the very first people that we wanted to have was, of course, Carlene Ray. And the problem with scheduling her then, I remember it so well, she was just so busy. I couldn't get her, you know. And finally, about a year into the program, uh, she joined. I have to put in just another plug for the museum. If you like what we do, uh, and we have a wonderful staff. Tracy Hyder Suffern is our executive director, a wonderful administrative staff. Of course, Christian McBride and John, Bar John Batista are our longtime artistic co directors. We'd love your support. And so, if you are so inclined uh, to make a donation or to find out more about the museum on your way out, it's a 501c3, so it's tax deductible. And, uh, woo! <laughs> All right. And uh, that was my accountant. <laughs> but, but anyway, now to get back to Carlene Ray and this wonderful afternoon. There's more live music coming. Paul has more of his wonderful historical footage and, uh, and photographs. But I just want to share a little bit of the interview that we did almost 20 years ago, back in 2005, at our old location. Here it is. And, um, you know, when people go to hear a lot of classical music, and I say this as a, as a faculty member at Juilliard, but it's true, uh, you know, people don't act the same way. The, you take the mic because I'm going to start talking about it. But, but, but I mean, people don't act the same way. I had a student at Juilliard. He did half jazz and half classical. That's something that I learned was let the interviewee talk. It took a while, but I, I eventually figured it out. Here we go. And walked off the stage. Here we go. Have you come and, and, and participate in that one? Okay. So to pick it up, where we where we left off, we were, we were I was getting the, the <laughs> chronology straight about school and then which band and, and with Erskine Hawkins band and then with the Sweethearts or no no the, the no Sweethearts first. were first okay and right. then Erskine Hawkins right what happened after the Sweethearts and and after and Erskine Hawkins. Hawkins well I I went to the uh, Manhattan School of Music and got my masters in voice as I said I studied with John Brownlee yes. and it was a Wonderful experience. Uh, I wanted to uh, be proficient in voice because I, I was, I found myself to be a natural singer, but I wanted to hone my skills so that I would be, uh, because being a, a contralto slash baritone, which is what I am actually. <laughs> if you don't understand, that's. That, that's unheard of. <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. That's absolutely unique, what she just said. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, actually, my, my lower range is, is uh, commensurate to uh, the, the range of a, a, a baritone. Because in all the choruses that I have sung in over the years, I'm usually either singing tenor, baritone, and some place, in some cases, bass. If when needed, you know, for for uh, uh, emphasis or whatever the case may be. But nevertheless, uh, I, the teachers that I've gone to, <coughs> excuse me, after I graduated from the Manhattan School of Music, one of my beloved colleagues, uh, uh, Chorus Taylor Perkinson, oh. got me. In fact, I met Perky at at the Manhattan School. And uh, Perky got me with, uh, uh, 
I didn't ask him, but he insisted that I study with Claire Gelder, who was a fabulous, I called her Sergeant Gelder because she was used to giving orders, you know. But uh, she was a wonderful voice teacher, and I had the, the experience of my life vocally uh, uh, trying to do, do what she asked me to do. It's the kind of thing where you, where one day the light bulb goes on, you say, oh, that's what she meant, that kind of thing, you know. And all of a sudden, your voice starts to, when you continue to uh, work at it, your voice begins to fall, things begin to fall into place. And I remember one concert that I sang, it was the uh, Brahms Alto Rhapsody. And I did that with uh, Olin Gaston, who was, uh, for those of you who may, uh, that name may be familiar to you, uh, he was the organist of a church in Queens. I cannot remember the name of the church. I may have the program, but I'm an old pack rat, you know, so I keep all, all the old programs and things. <coughs> but Olin was a fabulous organist and choir master, and he invited me to come and do the solo <laughs> Uh, uh, the, the contralto solo in the, the, the Brahms Rhapsody, and I had a chance to sing with Joyce Mathis. The, some, some of you may remember Joyce Mathis. She and I did the duet from the uh, uh, Vivaldi's Gloria, and uh, I was so honored to, to sing with her. She was, but she just unfortunately got became ill. I don't know whatever what her illness was, but I just was so very sad when she passed because I was just getting to know her, you know? And she was somebody whose who's, uh, talents I admired no end. And to get a chance to sing with her, wow. But m when I sang the, Bra the Brahms Alto Rhapsody with Olin Gaston, that was one time when I knew I was sounding very good. I mean, I felt so comfortable. And everything that my teacher had taught me, that Miss uh, Gilda had taught me, fell into place that day like you would not believe. It was, it's, it's one of those kind of things, you know. But nevertheless, uh, 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 as you can hear, <laughs> I get probably get called sir on the phone <laughs> more than most of the guys in the room here. How's the never, as we say down home. <laughs> uh, I have always been very, uh, I, 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 since God gave me this voice, I've always been very uh, diligent about wanting to share it. I like to share my talents because I'm not going to be around forever and a day and nobody is, but nevertheless, I like to, uh, 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 I like the enjoyment of sharing what I, what God gave me. But, uh, and I've been very blessed with, the, with my education and all that sort of thing. But that's one reason why I now I enjoy uh, teaching at the new school. I sub for Junior Mance whenever he has to go out of town. And Junior is a wonderful, he's a, oh, such a nice man. Oh. And um, so he never tells me what to do when I go to class to teach. And I've been doing this, I've been helping Junior out for about, I don't know, 10 years now or so. But uh, it's a pleasure. I love working with young people. I just, uh, 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 it's just something that I, I, I just want to give back and I want to see the young people succeed, but uh, they, have, they have to find their own way. But I'm trying to get them to understand with all the classes that I teach. I've, been, I've, I've honed my skills, teaching skills, from the Jazzmobile. When I, and it seems as though here lately, in the last 10, 12, 15 years, when I think about something, and, and wish for it to happen, sooner or later it happens. So I must be on the right uh, uh, wavelength mm -hmm. with the man upstairs. However... I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to give you some reading material about the Jazz Museum. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I see no, I get, uh, <laughs> all right. But I think that was a nice clip of her. I think we really learned a lot about Car Carlene from that wonderful moment. Just 19 years ago, that's something else. Huh? Oh, later I'll show you, because actually there's some folks here today who are in the audience, including Paul and Catherine. Uh, yeah. we were but, uh, we were I think both of these beautiful interview clips reveal so much about Carlene's priorities. 
It was education, learning, teaching, mentorship. That, those are the cornerstones of, of her career and what uh, enabled her to achieve and share her art. Please continue. Yes. Can you? So back to the archive. Um, Carlene is still on the road with Sweethearts. Is this, can you hear? Yes. Yeah, okay. And she stopped at Joe's Deluxe Club in Chicago. Jackie King, her classmate at Juilliard, they joined the Sweethearts together. And when they were on tour, they shared bills with artists who often signed photos to Carlene, as did Joe Liggins and all the honey drippers in July 20. All the honey drippers. All the honey drippers. <laughs> and they were on tour in Los Angeles and arranged for a photo shoot. Edna signed this photo to Carlene. What happened to Edna Smith? She moved to Africa, I think. Yeah, and then eventually passed over there, I believe. She yeah. She moved to the Bronx. <laughs> she moved to the Bronx. <laughs> she, 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 she did spend she, time in Africa. She changed her name, too. Adet. Adet. Okay. Yeah. So this was from that photo shoot in L.A. that Carlene signed to Mama. I'm going to show a little uh, bit of a, another clip of the Sweethearts, which features Carlene uh, high up in the mix on rhythm guitar. <laughs> There is the Epiphone FT Deluxe that she's playing with the Sweethearts, which we, we have right here. That guitar was in disrepair, uh, serious disrepair. There, there were a lot of, growing up, there were all my grandfather's instruments, all kinds of instruments under the grand piano. That seems to be where the, all the violins and all these things, mandolins, everything lived. And so we opened the case, guitar case one day and said, oh, what, what, what's going on here? So we had our good friend Tom Crandall, who is the uh, guitar whisperer in New York City, uh, restore it. Before he got to it, it was basically firewood. It was in pieces, yes. Um, and Carlene tells the story about, where, Carlene, where did you get that guitar? Well, Steve Gibson gave it to me. Here's a... F and that's that guitar. <laughs> that's that guitar. Steve Gibson led a group called the Red Caps, and he had different groups before that under different names. And this is a, a group from 1941 showing Steve playing that same guitar with a D'Armand pickup. And we said, he just gave it to you, Mom? Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's all she would. That's all she said. All she would let on. So we mentioned the circuit that where big bands played in the late 40s. One of them in St. Louis was Club Riviera. And at this point in May of 47, Carlene had just left the Sweethearts, but I show this slide because Lewis Russell, who she didn't know at the time, they didn't know each other, but his orchestra went into the Club Riviera for two weeks from May 2nd to May 14th. The following day, Thursday, May 15th, the Sweethearts came in for two weeks. Yeah. 
So the smaller versions were, were doing jam sessions. And the, the, the interesting thing about this photo, and you can barely see him behind Carlene, is Sonny Greer sitting in on drums, Duke Ellington's drummer. I don't know where, we don't know the location. Here's another review, interestingly, singling out Carl, Carlene from her scrapbook, a review of the Sweethearts, talking about her signature songs. And she wasn't only the, a guitar player in the band, but she had featured numbers. And we found a recording of her doing Night and Day with a small group. The arrangement goes on and they start playing double time real fast and she's chunking away on the guitar. So after leaving the Sweethearts, Carlene gets right out there and she's performing as a lead vocalist on reviews, in this case Club 845 in the Bronx. And um, it, it gets written up in the New York Amsterdam news. Um, so this is just... Uh a part of what that says. Born in New York City, she started to study music when only four years old and got her first professional chance with the Sweethearts of Rhythm, leaving this aggregation recently to go on her own with her goal fixed to make her deep baritone voice heard around the world, a goal as fixed as her talents. Uh, present hit at the Club 845, Miss Ray still finds relaxing moments in developing such hobbies as making her own gowns, she made all her own clothes, bowling, horseback riding, and ice and roller skating, which is true. And here's a photo of her at that 845 club in the gown that she made. She made all her own clothes, all her own professional clothes. Another group on the bill, the Four Notes. So after going out and playing some gigs trying to promote her, her singing style, Carlene gets another big band offer and joins Erskine Hawkins' big band in 1948 and tours with him for almost three years through the early 1950s. Um, there was a, a program for the Erskine Hawkins uh, entourage and they took a couple of her photos. This is from an Erskine Hawkins program. There's Carlene, and some of the other personnel are identified. Erskine is back here. You know, I just got to say, I knew Dan Michael, who they mentioned, he took the place of, uh, what's his name, Avery Parrish. Oh, yeah. And he had only had one hand. Wow. He, he lost his left hand and, uh, and played great, great piano. And, you know, it was very unusual in those days. I'm trying to think of women who were regular members of a big band, not just like a featured person right. who came out. Well, of course, we all know about Mary Lou Williams. Right. But there was also a female trumpet player named Billy Rogers who Ooh. worked in Woody Herman's band. Right. And Carlene is one of just okay. three or four or five that ever happened back in those days. I don't, more should be made of it. Yeah. Yeah. And she also really liked to hang out. She liked to hang out. She didn't drink, smoke, didn't do any of that, but she could hang longer than anybody. 
I remember I once went to, soon after I met Carlene, she was playing in Roseland a gig with Frank Foster. And I was, I went and I was sitting with her and I, I couldn't outlast her. She just hung way past closing, closing yep. time. So itineraries in those days were sort of in this format. On the left, the, the, the cities, venues and states. On the right, the hotels. One-nighters. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just wondering, Carlene, if you ever heard any stories or anything. How did she navigate this? I mean, it was one thing, frankly, being on a road with a band back in those days in the South and all this kind of stuff. And then the added thing of being the only girl, woman, in the band. Or did she just suck it up and say, I, yeah. I did it and that was it? Or You know, it's not, it, being the only woman is not, uh, not, not that big a deal, really. You know, I mean, uh, she didn't, uh, she got with guys that she wanted to get with, and then everybody else, she was like, no. You know, no. <laughs> And, I didn't and, mean it like that. But I did, okay. because that's part of it. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And so, you know, like Billie Holiday, you know, with Artie Shaw, like the same, it's the same thing. Women deal with what they got to deal with. And that's just, that's just the way it is. You want to work, you got to deal with that, you know? So, yeah. Unfortunately, Carly never recorded with Erskine Hawkins' band, but as you can see from these, the ads and graphics, she was featured in Build. As a, as a vocalist. I think she used to say he liked the way she sang Imagination. That was his favorite thing that she sang. In 1948, a preview in the Mississippi Enterprise for an Erskine Hawkins gig. And as you can see, Carlene is, is uh, featured equally in photo and in billing. And they went into Indianapolis and played the Sunset Terrace, a regular stop on the circuit. And I love the description in the preview. <laughs> yeah. The hawk is coming and he will introduce to his large and loyal following his brand new discovery, that lush crush, Carlene Ray. <laughs> Come and see this hunk of pulchritude, remaining tops in looks. Goes on to speak about her singing and playing. Pulchritude. Pul pulchritude is a, is a Million dollar word in the black press, I find, in this era. Also, it sounds like W.C. Fields. A <laughs> hunk of pulchritude. Pul <laughs> the pulchritudinous Carlene Ray. She plays piano with the Yep. Yeah. Yeah, what was she? She was just a featured vocalist. I'm not no, sure she, she was played playing. Piano. Oh, okay. Piano, guitar. But when she oh. sings, that's it, brother. Yeah. So this is the uh, wedding day for Lewis Russell and Carlene in um, June of 1956. She had just graduated, gotten her master's from Manhattan School of Music in May. And uh, she is showing in this photo. And yes, I am in the belly at this point. It's my, my grandfather, her father, with, uh, behind my dad. And then uh, best man, Frank Anderson, behind Dad. And that was at North Presbyterian Church on 155th Street. Uh, I'm going to skip this letter. OK, so um, Carlene became very close friends with Mary Lou Williams. Tell us about their collaborations. And well, they, they did a lot of uh, bass piano duos over the years. And my mother was really instrumental in helping Mary Lou people the mass that she recorded. So, you know, mom got the choral singers for her and all that type of thing and made sure that that was, uh, that Mary Lou finished and recorded the mass as well as Carlene being featured, uh, featured soloist. We have a little clip here of a cabaret show, duo show that they did in 1978. Just piano and bass.
he's fast forwarding. So they start out playing standard. Because uh, Carlene has a feature, bass feature. The cabaret show was titled The History of Jazz. And of course, Mary Lou encompassed it. Thank you. So you, you remember some of the oldies. Wonderful to know. Uh, now I'd like to feature wonderful Carlene Ray playing the bass solo for you. One of my own compositions taken from the mass. Medi number two. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
just comment on something, just, just real quick, Paul, yeah. which is that, you know, today when we listen to this kind of jazz, and, you know, we'll call it swinging jazz, but very modern for, for that time, um, most of the people who play it, and most of what we're into is people delving in something that was already done a long time ago, frankly, and now people bring it to life in their new way in 2024, and that's all great. But just to remember that neither Mary Lou or, or, or Carlene there, that didn't exist when they were young. And they were already women of, of, of an age uh, who are participating like a musical world that like, wasn't around when they were 20, 30, 40. They were adapting to something so new and so fresh and so modern it's just worth kind of thinking about that for a moment, not looking at it like we listen to jazz today, uh, where you know it's a lot has been done already. That's just remarkable. And to be in the deep water with Mary Lou Williams, two instruments, it doesn't get higher than that. So yeah. I, I just want to say it's not just a lady playing the bass with a piano. Right. That's really <laughs> deep water and just incredible. I'm so glad you shared that. Was that just a, a something that was commercially issued or just... Uh, I, uh, I found it on YouTube. So oh, it's on YouTube. Great. I don't, I don't, okay. Yeah, I'm going to show it to my students. Yeah, right. there's, yeah. Uh, uh, it's an hour concert. Uh, so, another association that Carlene um, pursued was with Melba Liston, and maybe Catherine can talk about that. Well, uh, you know, I don't know much about that, but I did see them perform <laughs> together. And she idolized Melba Liston. You know, she idolized everybody that she worked with. Carlene did. So she was very uh, just enthralled with, with Melba Liston. And uh, at the time when she worked with Melba, it wasn't at her peak, I want to say. But she was still, you know, great. I mean, she had done all of her major arranging and everything before that. But she was still uh, touring extensively as, as long as her health held out. They did a State Department tour, Taiwan, Malaysia, and the Fiji Islands. And then oh. there was Ruth Brown. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, Ruth Brown, and? Carlene played electric bass with Ruth for mm -hmm. eight or nine years. Right? Yeah, in wow. the 80s and 90s, and, and recorded one album with her. Ooh, there's Rodney Jones and stuff, yeah. there she yeah. is, there's Ruth Brown. I own a second-hand furniture store. That's Tootsie Bean, the drummer. And I think my price... Oh, sorry. I own a second-hand furniture store. And I think my prices are fair. Well, I did. Until this real cheap guy came in one day. Saw this chair he wanted to buy. But he wouldn't claim the price was too high. So I looked him straight in his eye. And this was my reply. If I can't sell it, I'm going to keep sitting on it. I ain't going to give it away. If you want it, oh, darling, you got to buy it. And I mean just what I say. Now, how'd you like to find this waiting at home for you every night? Only been used This Carlene twice. and Rodney Jones. But it's still good and tight. Wow! <laughs> Man. <laughs> okay, so... So, in other words, she, she did a lot of work with, with a lot of different people at this time. Yeah. Uh, we have to be out of here at four. I'm sorry. You know, it's so funny. And I have to say, I just want to acknowledge, Paul put together this incredible program. And uh, uh, with all these archival things, and, you know, we were concerned about, do we have enough time to get everything? And he said, man, this is going to take four hours. <laughs> I thought he was kidding. <laughs> so all I can say is, because I don't want to give short shrift to any of this stuff. Will you come back? I'd love to. Okay. We will have a, because I, I have to cut this short if we're going to get to Catherine and the second set and to wrap up the way that we intended to. So um, this is just too good. So instead of just kind of like fast forwarding, why don't we just keep going and, and uh, if you, 
I, what I'd like to do, and again, please forgive me for, for this, but I just know that what happens at 4 o'clock, um, to have our, our last set of Catherine, and then we'll conclude with that wonderful piece of... Uh, yes. Carlene of, singing. Of Carlene singing. Okay. Yeah. So before I bid, bid you farewell, I just want to make a couple of um, shameless commercial announcements. Of course. Um, one is that this CD that Catherine produced um, was released in 2013. We have copies available for 20 Yankee dollars each. Um, Confederate dollars don't work. And um, <coughs> either cash or credit card. And... Oh, okay, that's, that's going to be the, the close. The other, the other announcement is this coming weekend, Catherine is, is leading shows at the Appel Room at Jazz at Lincoln Center, March 29th and 30th. Two shows each night, 7 and 9.30. And again, I want to thank both of you for this. We'll have a chance to thank them at the end of the presentation, and especially in light of this huge gig you got coming up. Uh, the fact that you came in today in the midst of rehearsal and the midst of preparation is so greatly appreciated. Thank you for the opportunity. We appreciate it. And, and thank you all for coming out and supporting us and helping us celebrate uh, Carlene and Women's History Month. Yes. Thank you, Paul. So you can just see Paul uh, for uh, CD transactions. Pardon my back for one moment. Philip, Philip in front of house. Okay, so we'll do uh, we'll do a couple, and uh, and this is uh, one that Mom actually recorded uh, with Ruth Brown from the album Ruth Brown Live in London, and they recorded that at Ronnie Scott's in London. On a string sitting on a rainbow got the string around my finger what a world what a life I'm in love I got a song that I sing I can make the rain go every time I move my finger lucky me can't you see Life is a beautiful thing Whenever I hold the string I'd be a silly so-and-so If I should ever let go I got the world on a string Sitting on a rainbow Got the string around my face
you very much. We will conclude. You know, I heard, uh, I go hear Yuka every year, uh, and I didn't know this tune beforehand, but uh, I heard Yuka playing this, and I said, what is this, what is that tune? And then I had to adopt it for myself. So uh, we'll do this one for you. And thank Yuka Aikawa once again for joining me. Thank you again. Gone with the wind, gone like a leaf that is blown away. Gone with the wind, my romance has flown away. Yesterday's kisses are still on my lips. I had a lifetime of heaven at my tips and now they're all gone gone is the rapture that filled my heart gone with the wind the gladness that filled my heart just like a flame love burned brightly then became an empty smoke dream that is gone with the wind First of all, we have a time for a short question and answer session because I know some of you probably have something to say or maybe you'd like to, to say something or ask a question or tell us about what you heard today. But one more time, applause for Paul Kahn. What? Yuka Aikawa. Yuka Aikawa on the piano. And of course, Catherine Russell. Thank you. Thank you. Could we turn the house lights on back there, please? Thank you. Any questions? Any answers? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm trying to remember Peanuts Hotel. Tell me if I'm remembering or imagining that I probably heard the whole song something like 50, 60, 50 years ago. Yes, you did. No, I, I was half joking. Uh, the question was about Peanut Tucko. Did he see him 60 years ago at a hotel in, in Manhattan? Probably. I mean, he was working all over the place, right? 60 years ago would have been, yeah, why not? And I went to Japan with him 35 years ago. So he was mm. still, still very much around in yeah. those days. Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Eight forty five Flatbush Avenue, Paula. Oh, Prospect yeah. Avenue Bronx. in the Bronx. At the Prospect Avenue station. Prospect two and the five train. Two and the five train. Prospect Avenue station in the Bronx. Eight four five Prospect Avenue. That's Paula Boris Williams, the daughter of Maxine Sullivan, yes. <laughs> commenting there. Yes, sir.
I, I, I have a favorite. Would you come up and just say it on the mic because we're we're broadcasting out, and this is something for for posterity. So if it's more of a statement than a question, then I can repeat just to make sure that we get it on online. Thank you. Just about a year ago, a dear friend of mine who's here, uh, James Huffman, introduced me. He's, we send music to each other all the time, and he sent me you. And I, I had not known of her, and I've been around for a minute or two, but um, I had not known of her. And when I listened to it in the quietness of my own home, I was so moved, just transcended. The clarity, the spirit that came, and the, I saw your journey and everything, and I'm so honored to, to be able to do this. Thank you. Ashe, Ashe. Ashe, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. And since it's Sunday, uh, we're gonna go to Duke Ellington and Carlene Ray. And I think we'll bring the house lights back down, if we might. And uh, our last message from Carlene Ray.
just told me she was 80 when she did that. Thank you all for coming, and remember Carlene Ray.